He is a emeritus professor at uh, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. And before that, he's had a very distinguished career, uh, including stints at the Delhi School of Economics, at Cambridge University, Oxford University. He's been professor of development studies at the London School of Economics. Um, and of course, uh, after that, Erasmus. Now, the subject of his presentation uh, is titled Beyond Hubris, China and India Before and After Reform. As I said, this is an unusual subject. Now, I think you will be, if I may use the word, very spellbound in the next 40 to 45 minutes with what I suspect he will say. I see, I suspect that I have heard him on a few occasions in the last few weeks uh, and been equally struck by the way that he has developed this theme. Um, now, there are three particular reasons why I think this will be a very thought provoking lecture. One is that it's not the usual India China discourse that you will hear. It's about India and about China. It's very different from what we normally hear when we open our, I won't even say television, when we open our uh, newspapers and our journals. Secondly, uh, uh, and this is what my own take uh, on what you might say is about, that it is more to do about the peoples of India, the peoples of China, rather than the strategic elite of India, the strategic elite of China. And thirdly, it will, I think, be highly action-oriented. And that's where this bit about hubris comes in. Hubris, as many of us know, is a term in Greek tragedy, which means overweening pride. And it is a trap. Um, but if you give in to that overweening pride, then what happens after that is nemesis. And I don't think we want to get into that. So we should listen and hear Professor say very carefully. So over to you now, Shwini, for the next 40 minutes or 45 minutes. And I'll give you a little portion yes, about seven, eight minutes before. Thank you. for this invitation. I am not sure I was wise in accepting it. Um, I already know that I've lost a few friends here who have had to give up the afternoon bridge game. But some of them will really love their siestas and here they are. So I've given them a simple rule. You can mud off, but please don't snore. <laughs> so anyhow, I'll do my best to try and keep you Away. I was half thinking that, you know, probably you could have just have carried on since you already know more or less what it is that you people should expect out of and say, how we do it. Um, all right. Uh, it's a wide ranging theme. Obviously, it's a, it's a kind of storytelling and stimulating a conversation because I'm very aware, acutely aware of the depth of expertise um, across the board but also especially in China, which is around in this room and in the Institute. So uh, I was recently in Goa at the uh, ICS conference there, and I uh, learned a great deal. Um, I also learned that uh, some of the, um, I must say that the uh, external affairs, the uh, collection of excellencies who were there were really all correctly made, equally excellent, they were, they were wonderful. So I. I I must say that I am a little bit confident in, uh, in approaching all of you. Right, but yeah, I speak as an economist. I don't speak uh, Chinese. I don't read Chinese. I'm not a so I, mere culprit, so I'll start with that. 
um, a few minutes on my connection with China, um, more or less accidental, 1979, I was in Oxford at uh, the University, uh, Queen Elizabeth House. One of the staff members there was Neville Maxwell, that all of you will know. Um, I've not been able to ask him whether he's read uh, China's India War and what he thinks of it, but um, he was a good friend. Um, and the Barrett was uh, Keith Griffin. Neville was a friend of uh, Jewel Lai and had connections with some friends after the 1962 natural process. And so he was organizing one of the earliest uh, university delegations to go to China um, in 1979 after the uh, so there was one from Yale and one from Oxford, so five or six persons, I was one of them. Then after that, I've actually been very many times, um, a lot in the countryside, um, a lot in well, many different provinces and so on, and going to all sorts of communes, enterprises, brigades, houses, and all that sort of stuff over since 1976. So it's kind of a tracking of that process, I've been doing that. Um, so that's my, in a way, my, my link. I've written on it, and I think the thing for India, I was always seeing things naturally through Indian eyes. And the thing that strike you, uh, things which are very different from what strike things that come from the West, um, it struck me that, you know, wherever I went in China, uh, in the early years, uh, you couldn't find underweight children, you could find more overweight children, especially because there was an overloading of boys. So some of them were like Michelin, Michelin, Die of boys, but um, kids all in school, very uh, unusual kind of things, no beds in the streets, uh, naturally. Um, at 16, you joined the official uh, naval force of the, of the commune that you belong to. The land was owned by the village, effectively, like a hamlet uh, production team, collectively owned, not owned by the state, uh, collectively owned. And the returns were shared. Um, now, this kind of uh, arrangement in the commune, and of course, there were for every about 10 teams that came together, they would form one brigade. So the teams are doing agriculture mostly and repairs and so on and so forth. The brigades would have more industry enterprises, <coughs> seed farm, things like this. And then about 10 brigades would form a one people's commune. Um, the communization process happened very rapidly in China. There's one of the themes we, which I'll touch on again, uh, the ability of China to move fast. And this is um, not to be taken lightly when you consider the, uh, the mass of people who, have to be, who are moving fast uh, and moving in the same direction. You could be moving fast in different directions like in India. And I think a lot of energy is actually in polarities which are opposed polarities. There's again a point which is going to come up. Whereas in China, uh, the example I always use is of a school. A school used to have this class and then magnetism, and you had a magnet, and you had these iron shavings. And it used to be great fun to take the iron, the magnet just over those iron shavings, and all the shavings would go over this direction. And you took it the other way, they all went in the other direction. Well, you have a metaphor there for, for, for China. Uh, people followed, uh, largely, as you know, 90% or so Han. They did believe in the government. Uh, they had a revolution, they had a big land reform. There was no reason not to believe in the government. Uh, they do. And so it was a, uh, this process of being able to move very fast which expressed itself in, in institutional change. Uh, communization took place in two rounds. The first round was very rapid. Uh, elementary producers, cooperatives, advanced cooperatives, into communes in the space of something like you know, a year and a half, most of China was covered. Communes are too large, they had problems, it coincided with a great deep forward, coincided with a famine, coincided with three bad years in, 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 uh, in, in the weather. So between all that, there was a, a big famine which took place and so on. Then they reorganized, 62 to 65, communes became smaller in size, and they became more compact, became this three-year commune that we then had from 1962 till 1978. Now that period, to my mind, is a transformative period. And when I say in this in, in the abstract that uh, in this 40th anniversary celebrations, you know, uh, of the reforms, uh, it's almost as if you've forgotten what happened before the reforms. It's not just the contribution of the reforms; it's also the contribution of the revolution before that in that period, 
which laid the foundations for what happened uh, and the success of the period after the reforms. Uh, of course, history is written by the victor, and so we always try to say, oh, my God, it's all nonsense, you know, planning period, all nonsense. And, you know, we like to do that. But they're, they're, you know, instrumentalization of history, uh, contemporary history, is, is part of the in, part of politics. And, uh, but I think it, uh, we have to penetrate that and go beyond it. And I think in China, that early period was very profoundly important. Now, I have to say a bit more on that. Why do I think it is profoundly important? Um, Economists think of um, think of the agrarian question. Now, what's the role of agriculture, the rural population in, in development and growth? Uh, you can say, well, you know, they will supply raw materials, supply labor, they supply finance, and, and that kind of thing. Yes, the, the question supplies to the also supply markets. Uh, so that when industry produces, it goes back into to the countryside. In China, they were not interested in products of industry going into the countryside. They wanted to accumulate those in, in the big industry, industrial sector. So they wanted the rural sector to consume more or less on its own, as much as they could. Uh, but they wanted the productivity of agriculture. <laughs> so there's a profound transformation in Chinese, in the Chinese countryside in that period. It takes place primarily within the framework of the People's Commune, and there are two drivers in this. The first driver is something that Mao called labor accumulation. Everybody talks about capital accumulation. You're innovative thinkers, you know, that's the Chinese out of the think out of the box. So you call it labor accumulation. So he said, and so people have a large population, so many mouths to feed. He said, no, not so many mouths to feed, so many hands to work. So you set the hands to work, and you transform the infrastructure in the countryside. And uh, so you can do that at every different British level, something or the other. Now, for, for Indian years, uh, what that program was, what uh, you would say, I would say a multiple scaler for what you see in the data. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a multiple of that. I've actually researched on this, and I've done a comparative paper on this. Um, and it is, I think, the, uh, the effect of the Chinese labor accumulation programs over that period are uh, some sort of a massive multiple of what you have from Narega, even if Narega is actually producing assets. But in this case, assets were being produced. And of course, as I said to you, the Chinese masses move collectively in large numbers uh, and fast. So when they do something well, they do it very well, and, and it's transformative. And of course, when you make a mistake, it's also a bad mistake. And there were some bad mistakes in this. But if you see the systematic erosion of, of assets or non-production of assets in the Rega, and that kind of thing, and you compare it with what was going on in China, then China is a, is a, is a dream world. And there's a different thing happened there. And the proof, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So you see what comes out in terms of uh, production from that side. So this one. The other one is rural industrialization. Now, we know that in India, for example, crafts and all that sort of stuff got more or less competed away from the villages. Those of you who go to the villages, you will see that there's nothing, anything tradable in terms of manufacturing or production activity is gone. Um, and this is not, that wasn't the case. So if you had got a little weavers or bass parcel, they would all be brought together in one hall. Uh, that gave the basis of modernization. Uh, you don't all have to employ all of them. Uh, new machines could come in, they could share the products, they could learn and start marketing with somebody else. So there was no competition and easing out. And as I said to you, because the industrial sector was not interested in financing the consumption in the countryside, it also meant there wasn't competition from in urban manufacturers. As well as in India, it wasn't the industrialization of the colonial times, it was the industrialization under modern industrial uh, development in India, which was you know, selling all sorts of things to the countryside and displacing rural production. So, now what happens here? This, this kind of an idea that you can have an improvement in production, productivity, um, in agriculture, also in industry, uh, it means that you can have that and yet not be displacing labor, not be displacing livelihoods, and if you have more profits and productivity coming in, it is collectively owned, so it's collectively shared. Take, take, take a thing like mechanization, say, um, in uh, whether it's whatever, any kind of tractorization, for instance, it releases labor, in China, the labor would go into non-farm activities. The profits which are earned would come back to everybody shared through the work point system. So, and same for labor accumulation. You would work, you would get some work points. The work points would be valued at the end of the year, depending on the productivity of your land. That productivity of land was influenced by your labor accumulation, some mitigation here and there. It would come back to you as a post-production payment, rather than a wage payment to be paid at the start, which creates a problem for countries like India. So you have a built-in mechanism here for sharing. So there is no conflict, the classical conflict between increasing labor productivity and displacement of labor employment, that conflict is not there. 
as far as the countryside is concerned. So these were the two factors which really transformed the countryside. And those of you who know the role of uh, township and village industries and how powerful they were, both in early exports and in driving uh, the, the transformation, early years of the transformation. Well, township and village industries are late commune and brigade industries, renamed. So that, I, I think, this is one side of it which I want to mention. Well, you can have, I said this labor question, this is resolved, but then there is a question of being able to absorb the labor. There is massive labor to absorb. Here, I'd like to see about China, something which, again, will come back in terms of India. You have an absorption, of course, because you automatically join the workforce. So this means that if, if, the, if the productivity is low for, the, for your unit, you're all poor to some extent in that way. You're sharing the poverty as well, apart from the, uh, the productivity. <clears throat> but you have an automatic employment stick in the countryside. You don't have destitution of this kind. Uh, you automatically have a job. You're part of the team. You're part of the workforce. Whereas this is not the case which, you, uh, which we have in India. We are, so when you, when you think of labor absorption, for a long time the surplus labor is hidden in, in these units. But then, how do you actually take it out? You can say, well, you know, there was a lot of transfer of agriculture to industry inside the commune. Because rural industrialization took place quite dramatically. If you went to the communes which were in the peri-urban areas of, of major cities, they were like industrial estates. Agriculture was high productive, but a small proportion of the total. So this is the kind of thing that is going on there. And labor is transferred inside, but at a later stage, they keep it like so. This is, again, the Chinese capacity to control and manage the system. With the hukou system, you know, you don't let uh, labor move and all that. But when you find that the industrial labor force, the wage rates begin to rise, it starts getting to be uncompetitive, you start releasing the valves of migration from the countryside. And on a city-by-city uh, -city basis or provincial basis, you start, be, 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 and that's your migrant workforce, you know, the seasonal workforce, the floating population, two, three hundred million, whatever number you want to put in it, depending on your <laughs> definitions. And they come in into the being absorbed now into modern industrial production in the, in, in, in the national sector. So, but can that also absorb it fully? Well, it's done very well. In China, far better than in India. We are, we are nowhere near this. We have a serious problem of an overhang of surplus labor in the countryside. Uh, we have a lot of poverty in the countryside. Those people do not have a, a, access to the assets to land, like uh, collective ownership in China. They don't have an automatic right to employment, like they did in China. They can ask for 100 days or something in the Vega, but with all its, uh, its hassles and so on. And there is no relationship between uh, rural industrialization in India and the returns of rural industry going to the rural population. Here, if you get some entrepreneur or somebody who sets it up, or brick kill or something, well, you set it up, and that's that. They, they get the result, the, the funds, and not people further below. So this is a question, a great question. I'll come back to this, because I think this is one of the, um, I was saying, Ravi, that, you know, Parab Vartan wrote a book uh, on India and China, and the subtitle was Feet of Clay. And I think he was, he was looking in the Chinese direction when he said feet of clay, but I, I really believe that feet of clay really applies much more to India. And this agrarian sector is, is to my, I'll, I'll come back to that. I think this is a really a very bad, uh, it's, it's a serious problem in this, this regard. Now, let me take, switch a little bit from here and come into, a, into another um, line of argument. Years ago, Arthur Lewis, Nobel Prize winner, uh, he said that the problem of development is how to raise the rate of investment in an economy from 12 to 15% from 4 to 5%. If you can raise it from 4 to 5% to 12 to 15%, you're on your way. Capital output ratios are assumed to be 3 to 1, 4 to 1, which would give you a rate of growth of 3 to 5%. Population growth rates at that time are two three percent in the third world, which would give you, if you did the range, zero to two to three percent in terms of per capita income increase. If you took that as a as the rate at which transformation takes place, I don't know, it could take you hundred years uh, if if you kept on track and nothing else changed to have any kind of transformation. So now that I think that kind of thinking was at the start. But if you take China now, you're looking at forty four percent. Uh, India is around 30 odd in the, in the 30s. Um, and the, the shocking thing is, if you look at China and you say, oh, rates of growth of 7%, but you know, 40 plus in terms of rates of investment, you're looking at capital output ratios, which are 6 to 1, 6 and a half to 1, which is uh, mind blowing. Uh, but again, 
you must link it to the kind of discussion you might have on infrastructure because there's such a lot of front loading and uh, loading into infrastructure that that absorbs a lot of this uh, investment which is not really directly producing output in the immediate uh, period. But if you have this kind of investment, um, the rates is low because you're poor, you're poor, you're dependent on agriculture. I want to make a point here. As the, agreement, as the structure of the economy shifts from agriculture to industry, the constraints of diminishing returns are lifted. And industry is subject to economies of scale. Um, so your rates of growth can go up quite dramatically. And when you go from manufacturing into services, then you find your, your, your dependence on resources goes down even further. And then actually the rates of growth can fly away. Uh, and that's what you're seeing. So inbuilt in a successful process of transformation is an accelerator for, for the growth rate. This is what really happens. But of course, as you keep growing in this manner, you have to sell your products. And if you're a small country and you have to sell, like Taiwan and Korea or something like this, in a, uh, you have to think of exports and orientation outwards. And even China, with its, uh, with its massive uh, you know, domestic market, still has to worry about uh, and go to the export side. So there is a question of how to maintain this. This is the, the thrust of the need for the for an external market was the central reason by Rosa Luxemburg, for example, a uh, German Marxist, um, linked it to a theory of imperialism. She said this is what actually forces the economies into looking for external markets and then trying to capture them in one way or another. Now, we know that in uh, earlier times, these imperialisms were straightforward as we understand them. Uh, the world is broadly imperialist countries and countries that were colonized and, and that type of thing. Uh, so th that is the uh, environment of imperialism of that kind. You need some sort of a thrust to be able to export. Um, so there is, this is one drive. Yeah, I mentioned to you the structural transformation that it accelerates. As you go further into in services, which are education and innovation based, and you go into new forms of services which are bringing financial services, and financial investments, you start getting further multipliers which actually introduce inequality. Um, so you have a process of globalization, which involves all of these things going on, which engenders, has an inbuilt uh, inequality um, uh, generator into it. And so you have all the time, whether you take China or this, or the US, as the financialization occurs as part of services uh, expansion, you get, uh, and also for globalization itself, because it's based on high-tech uh, industries and higher education, you get uh, inequality coming in a bigger and bigger way. Along with it comes a displacement of, uh, of, of labor, relatively speaking, through technological change. And then you have the big question. You can't absorb your labor, and you have high rates of growth coming up from services and from manufacturing, uh, but you can't absorb your labor, and the inequality is very high. So this poses a question for a, a, a country and a government, and I've called it a, a potential conflict between nation and capital, or state and capital, because you have foot-bound labor, they can't just run away from the country, and the elected government has a responsibility to, to them. And you have foot-loose capital, which can go away any way it likes, and you cannot really fully control it. So how do you actually manage in a country which is not doing well, capital can go out, and labor cannot. You have to manage this, and you have acute inequality, and that sets up a tension. Of, of, you can see that this tension is there very much in China as well, and in India as well, and how are these things differently handled uh, differently. So that's the, uh, the, the kind of um, frame that I, I want to um, set for you at, in the background. For I think it's perhaps best if I um, share just a few statistical pointers about the, the, the differences, and then switch into something qualitative. Uh, because I want to focus on institutions, and the role of institutions how it's, it's different from this, and how, what makes China different in this regard. But take, I give you one number simply, I mean, you have, if you take the death rate, I always like to use this, but death rate in, in, a, in, a, in a country is a pretty strong indicator of a variety of things that go into it. The death rate in, in China and in India in 1960, India was 24, China was 25. In 1978, India was 14, China was 7, 6.7. If you take 2010, China is at 7, 
modern economies, rich economies are around seven. And if you take India, this rate reached around around seven. But it has taken it one generation more to get to that level in terms of the death rates. If you take um, now that, that's telling you about the speed of change, which was coming in, that was in the, in the, period, in the collective period. And that's pre-reforms. And after the reforms, that, level, that levels off. Um, a second aspect which you, uh, I could sort of bring up in terms of the numbers and so on in this, is, um, and let's take it from, you know, let's jump because I think time is very, very uh, scarce. Um, I'd like to share with you um, things to do with inequalities in consumption, um, as have emerged at the end of the, of the period. So, a few numbers, not to ask you too much. But if I take consumption, say, of <coughs> consumer goods, consumer durables, and I take 2013, that's a figure for which year for which there is sort of roughly comparable data. Take something like, let's say, mobile phones is tremendously saturated. India is per hundred households 97.2, but China is 230. Okay, computers is quite important. If you take the countryside for computers, you have something like. 1.5 computers per 100 households. China, 20. If I take air conditioners, if you want to go in that direction, about 30 for rural China. Um, for rural India, 6. Color television, 113 for China, 50 for India. Refrigerators, 73 for China, 9 for India. Washing machines, 71 for China, 3 for India and so on. Now, what am I getting at? Partly, this is the reverse of what I was saying to you earlier. That I was saying that you know, the supplies which go from agriculture to industry, but agriculture also is an absor absorber of industrial investment, and you know, there's a market. And I think this is one of our big weaknesses here at this point in time, and precisely because we didn't resolve the agrarian question, and we've let uh, only the only elite in the, in the countryside, I mean, the, the richer people, but most of them actually are not able to afford ordinary durable assets of the kind that I've just listed for you. Uh, the data is from the NSS rounds uh, from 2011, 12. This means that Indian industry is missing out in the production and marketing of a huge, if you actually were to look at the scale of, of uh, what's happening as a gap between China and this, this is the source of growth in terms of domestic demand, what Chinese would call rebalancing. But we don't have a rebalancing, but we don't have a, we have an acutely unequal distribution of income. And the level, China also has an inequality of income, but it's at a level where they can actually, in terms of the Engels curve and so on, to actually be able to buy durable consumer goods of this category. And those goods are not being produced by overseas things, they are being produced mostly by Chinese companies. So there is a big capacity here which we are actually missing out on, and I'm just giving you a quotation here, I'm mean, just giving you that on, on the ownership of assets, but you can also, this carries over into consumption of food. I, I will not bore you with those numbers. Uh, so that's, that's one kind of a, uh, indication that the agrarian issue is, uh, to my mind, that's been a very major failure uh, for us. And it's, it's held us back and will hold us back uh, going all the way through. All right. So now let me uh, touch on another side. I, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned all these things in the thing about uh, the Chinese hubris and so on. So. I've tried with these few numbers to try and bring a pin to this balloon of Indian hubris. You know, people think, ah, we go catching up, we go take China, look at growth rate. Don't look at growth rates, look at levels. Uh, with that growth rate differential that you have at this point in time between India and China, say you're thinking of, you know, half a percentage point difference, you're a little bit ahead. And then just try and project how long it will take you with that differential growth rate to catch up with the difference which you have absolute differences in levels and you go again into a century or some, some kind or the other. You know, so it, it's not worth thinking on, that's what I mean by the hubris. People are, get distracted by these uh, number games that we are doing well and all this, it, it, it's a nonsense. So this what I mean that we need to be realistic. Um, this is not the Chinese dragon kind of uh, scenario, but you'll be realistic about 
uh, where you stand in relation to your neighbors and, and competitors. So take, uh, take for example, um, you can understand this. You look at trains. You look at high-speed trains for China. I suggest you have a look at the numbers are very quite daunting. I will not bore you with the numbers. I will look at infrastructure. Um, if you've been to London recently and taken the underground, and, and if you've been to Shanghai and taken the metro, compare the two. Um, you think that you are in a third world country if you go to London with too many services at this point in time. And Shanghai will blow your mind because you won't know what is happening. Because, oh, you know, a little bit outside Shanghai is not like this. That's true. But it really, if you take the depth off of that infrastructure, it is very wide. It is not, not, uh, not for nothing that, um, that China is really ahead. This applies to, uh, you're making their own islands. Uh, we, 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 of course, we have Ogibi Bridge. But you can take the other bridge, uh, too high, which uh, the Chinese have put up. And of course, there was a stretch where the bridge uh, was just too far away, so they made two artificial islands. And then the, and it goes there. And uh, in between that, the tunnel goes underneath the sea, and then it comes up, and so on and so forth. All done very quickly. So we can't com we have, let's, let's not compete in, in, in this sort of way. OK. Now, so where are we in relation to um, something comparative I've, I've already mentioned? And I just to clinch the argument about where we stand, I've said here is something controversial, which people may not like, that for India, we should be looking at a slipstream. You know, um, if you're a racing driver, and the, the back is good. Uh, somebody, when there's a tractor plowing the field, there's lots of birds there picking up things, there's an opportunity, you see, so, and I think for India, there's a, this time a very big opportunity uh, in terms of Chinese development. There's nothing new, there's nothing new. If you take, uh, if you take, say, Japan, uh, Japan developed um, through reverse engineering, as it, you know, the term is involved, but we're looking at the Meiji and, and subsequent uh, that period, through, through cotton textiles and so on. Now, Japan handed over, and the hand-me-downs, but they developed and the cost became expensive. They handed over to Taiwan and Korea. Japan was twice the population size of Taiwan and Korea put together. So the amount which was getting transferred, mostly from, I say, in textiles or in shipbuilding for Korea, is enormous. The potential there for transfer is enormous. When you take from Taiwan and Korea to the next round, the next Gang of Four and then Southeast Asia, it's about one to one if you take uh, Taiwan and Korea and you take, you know, the, except Indonesia, which was on the sidelines, it's about one to one the ratios. So again, there's a reasonable bit of transfer, but the other countries also coming in to, to, to demand, uh, you know, to see if they can pick on things. Continental Europe developed in the slipstream of, um, of, of, of the first industrial revolution to a large extent. So there, there's a spillover effect from, from the central core driving economy. And this is the, it's called the, the economy is called the flying geese pattern. You know, you, so you take over, then the, some of the economy takes over. I think comparative advantage has come down to China um, as it has opened up. And there's been, again, a transfer, massively a transfer from, from the West into, as we know, uh, in, into China. Now, China is moving on, becoming expensive. So you have a possibility here of a transfer from China coming through. This is what I mean by India and the slipstream. Because if you say we are competing directly with China, we are not, actually. We are not competing with China. If you look at the, closely at the trade figures, uh, there is more complementarity between trade patterns between China and India than direct competition in relation to manufacturers. So the scope for, scope for complementarity is, is, is very significant. Now, slipstream, I'd say, um, because I just, you know, for those of you who are not, you can follow this very closely. <coughs> Let me tell you the share of India's exports to China. Seven to eight percent live animals, animal products. Twenty-four percent mineral products. Another ten percent products of um, uh, plastics and things like this. Um, base metals and base metals, eighteen percent. Machinery, six point three percent. Uh, textiles in Paris, 26 percent. What do we take import from China? Machinery, 55 percent. Okay? Textiles in Paris, 4 percent against 26. Mineral products, 2 percent as against 24. So this is a classic pattern of a, of a developing country exporting to a developed country. This is the classic pattern in, in, in flying geese. Now, in that situation, to say we are competing with this area, you need to be a bit careful. It's really the thing is that if this scale, the Chinese scale of manufacturing experiences difficulties with regard to labor costs rising and they have to 
themselves reorganize, and there's a trade war, which is actually you know, opening up spaces, then India has a possibility to ask itself, is our manufacturing sector capable of actually exploiting these openings which are coming up? Now, if you ask me, there must be, there must be areas where we can. Must be areas. Services, we already are doing reasonably well, although China is, we are also in there, you know, much higher share of Chinese GDP is now is also generated by services, way much more than, than in our case as well. But what are those manufacturing products that we can sell? Is it in third markets? Is it in China itself? Now, this is, a, is an area of the backroom, you know, people to, to work out. And this is a, it's a, it's a valid question. It's a valid question. But it does tell you that we have a relationship at this time, not of animosity and um, of, of competition directly, but of, of an opportunistic complementarity, which can be uh, used and exploited in, in this period. Now, a few comments on, on, on China. Um, I think the Indian risk factors um, will, I will, will come up implicitly in this. Let me first give you um, a few risk factors which I think apply to, to the Chinese case. They've, moved, they've used the model of export-led growth, and I think they've, they've carried on with it. Export-led, where does it stop? Rosa Luxemburg says, never, it never stops. And where it stops is because there's no internal colony, no external colony left, and then the silk capitalism collapses. You know, that's the Marxian closed model. She had their problems with the equations there, but let's not, that's a historical process. As a historical process, it's pretty valid. Now, China has carried on with its export-led drive into the external zone. When they've hit trouble, they've gone, started rebalancing in many ways. This issue, you know, again, is one for conversation. What does that mean? How does it happen? How far? But I would say that with this Belt and Road Initiative, that they have actually committed themselves, and they are halfway across. It's a bit like my quest, you know, vaulting, vaulting ambition, uh, overleaping itself and falling on the other. Macbeth is halfway through the river, it's as easy to go forward as to go back. And so here's watering ambition. So uh, now I think this is what's happening with China. They're stuck in the middle now. There's no way of coming back. First of all, it's not one composite project which they started. It's a whole range of things which are assembled under it and then you are given a label line and so on. But there is a connectivity and there's an integration to that whole process. But the risk in this is that if you're doing this, you're doing this because you think it's a productive enterprise. Yeah. Now you can evaluate it as a as a production investment, an infrastructural investment on a global scale. I think those kinds of investments are very difficult to uh, to value uh, because they are dependent. You can have the formula uh, returns this, that, and the other, but the numbers which you fill in those boxes, uh, where do you get those numbers from? And those numbers involve making assumptions right across the board about continuities of investment and kind of supply chains and you know all sorts of breakdown in services, all that sort of stuff. So it becomes horrendous. So you're doing it on more or less on trust on a long scale basis, which is why when Enron or any other company came to India or comes to India goes elsewhere, they want the government to underwrite some rates of return because they can't have it like on any other commercial basis. And now, what happens with China? We know that China has got 80 odd MOUs and you know, 1200 projects and things like this. Many are into trouble here and there. We know the general strategic aspect of it. I would say that the risk is that the return to any one project is dependent on the, on the whole project being successful as a whole. There's no point having a necklace if the thread is broken and it just won't work. So if you have a pipeline, or if you have a fiber optics line, or if you have a rail connection, or if you have a road connection, which is traveling through six countries and going in hostile territories and going across, and then you're, you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable. And if that area is actually not guaranteed in terms of security of use, uh, you find that two things begin to happen. First of all, you find that your returns are then dodgy, become uncertain, and they're broken up. The other is, precisely because you want to avoid that, you made these heavy investments, you have to protect your investments. And so it's not only that you are running a risk of the returns not being good enough, but you are guaranteed to be induced and inducted into a framework where you say we have to protect our investments and how do you protect your investments? In the old days, you colonized people, you had your own military sitting there, you, were right. you don't have that now. 
So you're going to do it in some other form. And that some other form is to have a principal agent, client state. You have to get the local state to actually behave as if you are, you are doing your bidding, which they have to. And so this is now a relationship which is, I would say, functional neo-colonial uh, rather than directly politically uh, neo-colonial. Uh, this is going into a Tinbergen kind of a territory that you can have convergence uh, functionally without the names being the same. So he's saying, yeah, you know, let's not call uh, capitalism can be made to behave like uh, social democracy. We can control the functions of, of property. Likewise here, it's not really neo-colonial, but uh, it can behave in that way. We can so China will say we have everything contractual. Um, yeah. China says it's, it's contractual. Uh, it's, um, it's legal. Yes, it is contractual, but the contract doesn't make it uh, productive in itself. And it doesn't guarantee that security. Now, the other thing is that it's not as if the rest of the world is sitting there just encouraging you to carry on. Uh, China is, has got its drive, its, its own tryst with its own uh, uh, future global destiny, which is, you know, uh, being on the central, central, you know, the B dominant uh, hegemon or whatever. You can put it in other euphemistic terms. And if you have to do that, you um, you will be, you will get competition from the other side. It's not just locally, but we know what's happening over the trade war and all these sort of things. And you can, then you have proxy wars, or you have proxy interference, uh, subversive things which go on all along your chains of Belt and Road and everything else. They are subject to intervention. So if this game of, of displacement of one empire by the other, which used to be resolved by war in traditional terms, but can't be resolved by war anymore, if that game carries on and they are both equal sort of powers, they will actually be all the time undermining your investments here, there's something else, the government will change, you pay this government to actually do your bidding, they pay somebody else to get that government away, put somebody else in, in that government, and, and undermine that sort of thing. So I think China is entering this zone. And this is not a zone that they've ever been in. Because uh, they have been basically, a, it's a domestically driven economy earlier, and exposed where you are, now they actually have a direct presence in all these places where they have to do these things. So I think there's a huge, uh, massive risk involved in, in, in all this. Now, you can also say, well, you know, they invest this much money, they're going to lose this money. Well, then they have covered themselves up to a point, because the debt is given to the national your partner, and that debt is then, uh, the risk is carried by the, by the borrower. But uh, take Pakistan. Uh, do they carry a risk of, of indebtedness which they don't, uh, which they can't repay? They're supposed to start repaying next year or something like this. Supposing they don't repay. Uh, is there a risk who's, you could say, I get the money out of you. I'm a German banker and you're a Greek. And uh, I know what you do. You drink too much wine and you move around, you know, all those things which you know, that bankers are saying. I'll squeeze it out of you. Now, is China going to be able to do that in relation to any of these countries? And our answer is no. Uh, now, of course, the Belt and Road initiatives have gone into many areas where they also take imports from there in a big way. There you could have something, you know, payment in some form or the other. But there are many other areas which are strategic, of strategic interest, uh, like, like Pakistan, where there's no earthly way in which you can actually squeeze things out of there because they are, they're not interested in this, okay? Now, we know also that these investments generate incomes locally, uh, when they, the ecology of supply response is good. But if you take large areas around, say, Central Asia, it might take 10, 15 years, 20 years before any such thing may begin to happen. So the income is not picking up necessarily along with this infrastructure investment along the Belt and Road to create the conditions for repayment in, in locally. So I think the debt trap issue is a real issue. And I don't think that China, if China can walk away from it, but then they have a lot of debts given up, more or less bad debts. But if they don't walk away from it, then again, it, it's, it's a question of assertion. And, and it gets into a, a difficult territory. So I think they are getting into a zone where it is, it, it's a very problematic zone. Um, but of course, uh, it's, it's an existential issue for them, uh, reaching, their, reaching their, their ultimate goals. Now, two sets of points in this, and then I'll, I'll stop, because it's basically it's, it's meant to stimulate the conversation. One is, um, what kind of global risk is there in this, with the U.S. and all this? Now, you can never tell, with, uh, you know, when you have, um, how should I put it, uh, a challenged person uh, in an economy like, uh, like a major hegemon economy. Um, my politeness is actually uh, getting me to be this time. 
Um, I would like to use this kind of terms, which have been used by one recent new young congresswoman in the British uh, House. Uh, um, but do please read it. She had some interesting terminology applied to pres President Trump. Um, but I think there's risk involved in all that in a, in a big way, uh, for sure. But there are also some um, stabilizers. And I want to mention um, one or two stabilizers which, which make things, you know, you can say, well, things can't get out of hand and altogether. And the first one is that I think uh, increasingly there's a global um, domination of capital over state. Uh, we know that in the American system, the uh, key positions in the American system are the revolving door between finance houses, hedge funds, banks, and so on, and all the senior positions go, go spinning like this. You don't believe me, reach of these property, and he's not a left finger. So, um, and he's uh, called the Treasury uh, Military uh, and Treasury Finance Complex, and he's called the uh, Gozara Industry Complex. So, there is a, an emerging global elite, uh, which is in both ways. Behind it is a uh, are multinationals, which are on both sides. Half of Volkswagen is made, is, uh, the income comes from China. Um, Apple is assembled there, and not too much, a lot of it goes back to China, but 50% of, of Chinese exports are actually imports, which have come from outside. The processing trade is enormously high. In Korea, I think it's probably uh, three-fourths, but uh, Canada and Mexico is enormous again in relation to the US, but for China, it is over 50%. So if you, if you try to hit China, you hit yourself. You hit yourself as well. So that's one balance, balancing factor. The other one is that if you really want to get, if you get their growth rates down, China at this time, I think roughly speaking, accounts for about 40% of incremental demand globally. If you put India in it as well, we are over half of the global demand in the world in any one year comes from these two countries. And that is twice about the amount which comes from the US, despite the fact that they have about 3% growth rate at this time. EU is hardly anywhere in this. Yeah? So if you, if you hit these countries and you reduce their growth rates, it's going to come back to you because your economy is also very open. So I think at this time there is a kind of a lock-in, there's a bear embrace, and apart from which you know the deficit and surplus issues which are there between the, you know, that, that kind of symbiosis between Chinese surpluses and American deficits. Uh, so I think that there, is, there are some stabilizers which can, which can, uh, which, will, which apply, which hopefully will lead to a situation where good sense will prevail. But I call them stabilizers, but clearly they're not working uh, at this time. Because, uh, doesn't, you know, if you think, I mean, this town isn't big enough to take both China being number one and the US being number one. And I think that Chinese thinking, uh, American thinking, has to accommodate history. And so do we in India. And I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phase where there is an imperial change in the big you know, the system. Uh, it's, it's going to be multipolar. But uh, resisting it and saying it's not there, denying it is, is not going to get you any far. Uh, for India, as I said, it's a follower country at this point in time in the economy terms. And the opportunities, and I would say for the same reason as these large numbers which I mentioned to you, that uh, it would be, I think as it is, is wiser to be in a cooperative arrangement with China, where you have uh, the trade patterns are complementary, and the fallout, fallout effects, the, uh, the, the hybrid down effects from Chinese industry manufacturing relocating outwards uh, can be enormously uh, beneficial for, for, for India. So I think there is a possible win in this whole scenario for, for India at this stage. But it does need giving up this angle of hubris and getting a bit excited about what we're talking about India and this Chinese dragon and this sort of thing. And that sort of nonsense doesn't uh, help at all uh, in, in, in any way. It just clouds your mind and you can't then think clearly about where the opportunities lie. Um, I've read some things which about trade, which have come out from one Mr. Shadri and um, and, I, and he just is saying, oh, China is down, it's out, and we are going to, they can't do anything, we are capturing the markets in India. And I think that's a bit, a bit optimistic, going too far, going too far. Uh, Ravi, please allow me to say one last group of things. Um, and this is on some features of China, which uh, I've, going gone in and out, been observed, just observed. And I just want to share a few with you with this. I told you about infrastructure and investment uh, in this regard, but they have the capacity of using institutions as policy instruments. 
In India, institutions are sticky, hold you back, they are constraints. Whether it's judicial, as long as parliamentary democracy we really have, whether you're looking at Panchayati Raj, whether you're looking at your behavior in relation to your girl getting married to somebody in another caste, take any aspect of human and social behavior, our institutional dimension broadly interpreted acts as a constraint. We are, we are struggling to fight to assert some good values on it all the time, and it's, it's kicking, up, kicking back, it's pushing back all the time. China has used its uh, institutional framework as a policy instrument. It has shown a capacity to switch this way, go this way, come back, go again this way, and so you can collectivize, you become Maoist. You decollectivize, you become Dungist. You do something else, you become Xi. You go global, you become Xi. And, but what's common across all this? Chinese nationalism, Chinese accumulation, Chinese growth, and Chinese ambition to be number one, and Chinese reunification with the provinces that think have been wrongly taken away. So this is the, the, the scope, and they've, they've managed to show this time and time again. You know, Neville Maxwell called it the zigzag pattern. They go this way, they exploit the whole thing right to the end, swing the other way, exploit the other side. Because there's no market state, this thing, they say, oh, it's getting inefficient here, let's open, open up, the, go the other way. No foreign investment earlier, now foreign investment. Earlier on, it wasn't a Belt and Road, now you go out and do things. They have that tremendous capacity. So I think the other I told you about ideology and ionization, which was the magnet uh, metaphor which I gave to you. Another one is to do with the speed of scale of change. Another factor in that is what economists call information dichotomy. What is really a constraint on the ground? If you're a factory manager, you, are, you know what's going on where you buy and sell uh, uh, locally, but you don't have the idea of what really is required for the country as a whole. The so politicians have an idea, are supposed to have an idea of this. So there's a chain here, and this is a chain which uh, information I got, which, the, which led to linear programming, various other things, but this was done in Russia by Kantorovich and others. And the idea is you send signals down, the signals come up, and there's a form of iteration which happens. In China, it flies back and forth fast. And when they work out something is going, it goes to scale fast, and the scale is the country. Now, this is the kind of thing which I'm talking about here. I'll give you one example, and this I've seen myself, so I'm using it. Rice transplanters. First of all, rice transplanters, it will displace a lot of labor, but I told you no. It will release labor for doing more productive things. So they want rice transplanters. Which one? See, so, okay, national competition. National competition, work out three or four models, you work something out, and they choose for this region, this one, for that show, this one, for this show, this one. Two years later, rolled out. Now, that is the kind of scale which you have in this information dichotomy thing. So you have scale, you have speed, you have control, and lastly, you have uh, a perspective of the time horizon. And again, it comes back to our institutions and our policy. Which politician in India has a time horizon I suppose a few do, or four years or five years. But I think mostly people have a time horizon of one, two, three years. Banao or Niklo is the, would be a good logo for most of our politicians. And I think you don't have the 30 year frame over which things can be done and continuity can be maintained over commitment to, to transformation. And then, of course, there's the question at the incumbency. Somebody's done it, I must do the opposite. And sometimes there's more than a name change. Yeah? It's not just from one. Person. So, so I think that there are very many reasons why uh, there is um, China is, is where it is, and um, I, I think I have to stop here. Uh, but I've, uh, you might say, oh, well, China is in bad way. Another thing which comes up is an aging population. I'm sure somebody will ask me a question. Please do, so I can tell you about the aging population as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, this. Um, Anyway, this wasn't what I said there. I'm sorry, I don't know what time, so two generous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As I said earlier, it was a fascinating presentation. I'm sure all of you have got questions uh, and are ready to go. So we have about half an hour with us. So over to you. Please please keep your question brief and short. Yes, sir. Uh, for you, yeah. announce your name, please. And former secretary What are the lessons for in India from China, considering the institutional framework which we have and that we live in a democracy? Yeah. We take a let's take a few questions and then we. We'll
there was one question. Yes, sir. Can you repeat that again? Growth rate of the two populations. Male fertility this time uh, is 2.3. Uh, Chinese is around 1.6. The Chinese population, according to the latest numbers, is meant to peak at 1.44 uh, billion. Uh, in the next six to seven years, it will be peak. Uh, that's the kind of a phase there is. For, for India, it will carry on for, for rather longer, depending on how, you know, when the fertility rates decline. Um, that's that's the thing in it. So, uh, you must should hear about uh, lessons for India. Lessons for India. Um, you use these big words, um, <laughs> so, which are, you see, democracy and uh, things like this. And, um, you know, for me, um, democracy, like any relationship, any relationship has to be a, like a repeated game, is a repeated exercise. It has to, so it's an institutional arrangement. It has to deliver um, what it is designed to, what it is intended to deliver. And so it's a repeated exercise, and you learn by repeated exercises. Um, we've had 70 years. So it's enough, uh, I think, in my view, to start thinking of democracy with Indian characteristics. If I may put it like that. Um, I. I think the answer is the people who feel the most strongly positively about Indian democracy are the ones who have been the beneficiaries, which is all of us. Um, but if you were to look at the rest of the country, they all participate, like everybody participates in a bad relationship, because the exit isn't so clear. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's a good relationship. So the man might be beating up the woman, but it could still be called a marriage. Um, and I think our democracy is still called a democracy, but if I were to, if you, you were all to score it in terms of the functions of democracy and how well we performed, or the institutions of democracy and how well they have performed, I think it would be, and you didn't say India, you put some other country's name or some, you, you would not give it very high marks. So um, I would reverse the question, and I would say, you know, uh, how should we overcome the constraints of this form of democracy. Um, I don't have an answer. All I can say to you is that we are trying to create, just as the Chinese had the capacity to move large masses, India is also trying to create this capacity for trying to lose, move large masses. We are trying to create a majoritarian democracy at this point in time. And this also tells you that majoritarian democracies can be of different kinds. And uh, fascism in Germany was a majoritarian democracy. And I think there is nothing in India to, to gain by trying to imitate that form of majoritarian rule. Uh, so I think the answer, the proof of the pudding is in the, is in the eating. And I think for that we must have rigorous tests to say how are lives of, of, of uh, individuals impacted and so on and so forth. But the rights are very important. I think that's one of the things I took from your question. Rights are very important because if we, if we take rights away, you could say in a, in a perfect slave economy, the slaves were very well looked after, but they would be productive, but they didn't have rights. So I think we, we, uh, we must introduce the question of rights. There's no doubt about it. But if any system which is meant to be justified on the grounds of rights is not delivering on the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues all the time, then there's something going wrong there. Something going wrong there. And I, I think India is, is profoundly um, out of order in this regard. Just take the example. You mentioned that in China you can achieve your big infrastructure projects in one year or so. India takes 25 years. I have been monitoring the additional takes. The huge number of projects take 20 years more than that. So I think either the system is wrong, I mean the democratic system, or we need to, how do we need to change to talk about the full. In India it seems to be that there are different magnets and there are different for 
Who, who am I? Who am I to challenge the views of Indian government as expounded by a section of the government of India? I could entirely agree with you. Ambassador Sarum. Thank you very much for a very good presentation and for your remarks on the dangers of the debt trap in particular, the dangers of packaging geopolitics in geoeconomics, and so much for those who get who accept that such packaging at face value. I'd like to request you to say uh, throw a little light on their foreign exchange reserves position, uh, three and specific dimensions, sheer quantum. We all know is very high. The stock is high, but how are the flows affected in the slowdown now? Where did they come from, really? Because the FIF, FIEs, foreign invested enterprises, are very low value added per unit of product. So how come so, so much accumulated? Their own exports, where did the technology come from to reach such levels? But that's only academic. The main question is, why are they sitting on such high amounts for quite some time? Unproductive amounts, dead money. So other than the BRI that Xi Jinping kind of thought of in these years, there is no utilization and acqu acquisition of direct acquisition of technology firms of in the industrialized world, not accounting for a large chunk uh, out of uh, compared to the volume. And thirdly, which way does the leverage work? Are the Americans a danger because the Chinese hold such large amounts? Are the Chinese vulnerable because the Americans can this to on them? Net, because economists will always say on the one hand and on the other. But net, which way does the leverage work? Thank you. Thank you. Now, there are a lot of questions, Ashwini, okay. so I'm going to make a question and answer rule. Okay. Short questions and as far as possible, short answers. Do you want to take or do you want to deal with the three questions? Yes, okay, let me let me answer something. The, the reserves you know about 3.3 .3 trillion or something like this at this point in time. Uh, it's a big country. Um, somebody was saying the other day that, oh, well, you know, you think it's a lot, but if there's a run, uh, you know, things go, go down, expectations change. Uh, they, they, they could disappear in a very quick time. And, and I, I think um, I've been trying to say that um, that there is a, it's unlikely, it's not in the interest of either side or the agents which are investors on either side, uh, financial or direct uh, investors, to destabilize the situation beyond a certain point. The only thing which is destabilizing it at this time, there are two aspects to it. One is that there's historically there's a change and that has to be accommodated in some form. And the second, which sits on top of that, is that the American president, or that part of opinion, is not willing to accommodate that. And I think uh, the ex acute inequalities, I think this is the danger that we face at this time in the world today, unpredictability in, in political um, pronouncements and positions and stances taken. Uh, and the reason for that, in my view, is that the, what I referred to earlier, globalization and the financialization of the economy of the system, has generated such acute inequalities. You have, you know, not just the 1%, but the 0.1% and so on, in relation to the 99 and 99.9, this is the kind of inequality we have in the US, acute inequalities. And this is the breeding ground for populism. So if you were to ask, what's the difference between Bernie Sanders' uh, platform and, uh, and the Trump platform, actually, if you think very carefully, the cold head, you will switch the two, and you will not tell which is which. The styles are different, but it's about the same. It's about the same. Uh, one of the Germans was saying there in, in, in Goa, one of the German specialists, he said, oh, you know, the EU has the same goal as Trump, but they have a different language. Uh, now, the point is that you uh, you can, with, a, with your language, and by the way that you, you know, he thinks that if I punch you in the nose, then you will bargain better with me. I'll get a little bit more. At the end of the day, this trade war is what economists call gains from trade, sharing the gains from trade. And it used to be the thing, third world countries used to say, Free trade is a, is, a, is a trick, is a conspiracy, because the gains of trade are very unequal. They all go to the rich country, they all come to the poor country. Now the boot in the, uh, is on the other foot. And now we have India and China and countries like this wanting the free trade, uh, and the others don't want it in this way. 
So I think there is a, because I think they, they see that uh, by through, through free trade, they actually are losing out. They can't compete on, on this range of goods. But I think this, this uh, inability to absorb, uh, to adopt this position, populism has made the world very much more dangerous in, in, in this regard and unpredictable. Uh, this applies to right, many countries. And this, so I think that this inequality has to be addressed in some form. And it's a global issue. It will keep happening there. Even if you have high growth rates in China as well, or in the US, if you find that a large proportion of the population is excluded from it, uh, social and, and economic entitlements on a systematic basis regularly, it's going to be very difficult to maintain uh, that kind of a stability. You will start running into social and political issues. And that might lead to more and more exaggerated positions which are taken by the government including going to war, on, not on the grand scale, but on small things to actually beef up nationalism and you know, that type of thing. So I think there's a risk there which is very big uh, in terms of this. That I, has, I don't think that the foreign exchange uh, reserves thing uh, is, to my mind, uh, you could have twice that much or half of that. Uh, I don't think, for instance, the US has uh, foreign exchange reserves 125 billion, 125 billion. I mean, you know, because there's a, it's a reserve currency, you can't even manage to handle anything you know, which was there. So I, I, I don't think that that is a, my mind. There are other questions, but I think I must uh, take some from this side. Right, let two questions, one from Shankar and next from Ravi. Okay, Shankar. Thank you for that really fascinating talk. I was struck by what you said about stabilizers. Uh, the only problem is most of those stabilizers are economic. And most of the factors of instability are either political, strategic, or just individuals. I mean, the kinds of people who are in power around the world, authoritarians. And they're not really populists. I don't like calling them populists. They're demagogues. Because they don't, you, you shouldn't give them the people. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but how do you, you seem to say that the stabilizers will prevail, in your opinion. That assumes that we are rational actors, that that's, we are economic men. But we're not. We proved over and over again we're not. Why do you think, if you do think so, why do you think the stabilizers will win out rather than the others? Thank you, Ashwin, again, a brilliant and very interesting lecture. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, we could have this discussion later, but quickly my question was really to do with the way you pointed out the TV, uh, TV you know, the town and village enterprises that they start with the great leap forward, and you've always been very, very positive about some of the distributive practices, etc. during the great leap forward. There's been a lot of re a lot of research now on that period, Ashwani, and a general rereading even by the Chinese on many of the Maoist economic uh, redistributive, especially policies that you know, premised equality. <coughs> and in many ways, one would argue that Tang's position was radically different. In fact, Tang himself uses Marxism. Tang himself uses Marxism to argue for market reform. He says that you know, the means of production have not reached uh, that, that, that level. So I'm wondering how, you know, whether you check, whether you are sort of still as positive about that. Do you really think, wasn't it economic reform that brings China to this level? Do we tend to undermine, do we tend to overlook some of the positives and gains that those India and China have made because, like you pointed out, being now the countries that want that free market, that want globalization. Uh, especially if you can speak to the more Okay. Um, in reverse order, Shankar, okay. I, 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 well, you know, um, how people are reading it now, the earlier periods, this is uh, always uh, a bit suspect, and you have to read carefully what is being said now about an earlier regime. My, my general view has been, as I was, um, that. And that was my thing about using instru uh, institutions as instrumental variables. I think they use collectivization and transform the countryside. It was not an efficient. If you say, oh, I'm a neoclassical mainstream economist, you would not be in trouble. You would not know how to find efficiency. But still, there were many aspects of that institutional event which were not efficient. 
For instance, there wasn't very much trade horizontally between communes. There was only vertical this thing. So you could, there were a lot of issues of this kind. But in terms of local transformation, it was very powerful. Now, I, huh? Yeah, I and so at a certain stage, you find that, uh, now this is, what stage is it? This, this is always a question. You can, China actually swings from one to the other. Yeah? Now, there's a very interesting uh, perspective from um, Kershenkron. The, um, you know, the, the economic historian, Russian, then Yale, where he says that when these transformations take place and you get these new couples coming in a, in a powerful way, you know, there's a, what Oscar and I call national liberation pattern, um, the language they use is a language of Marxism, of socialism, of transformation and so on, but it doesn't mean that that's really the core uh, which is driving it and there forever, permanently forever. So I think that this was a platform which allowed bringing in, for instance, you had Private plots, they were not taken away. Market fairs started coming in, in, in the thing. Even when the reforms take place, the first three years when the, the growth really shoots, they still keep the, all the companies exactly the same. The prices are, are, are pushed up. Everything shoots up with prices. Now, if they had a different price regime in that earlier period, you would have had much higher growth. But that price regime is linked to actually trying to extract finance from the countryside. So I think there is a systematic change in strategy. And it so happens that it also coincides they put it in terms of this break from one to the other. Uh, so I, I, I don't, uh, and the same thing happens again when you're not taking foreign capital. These are. So my feeling is that there is an institutional change, and the underlying, that's what I said, the underlying lead motive of it is a national accumulation pattern which connects all these things. And it's Chinese. It's not this Maoist or this, that, or the other. But you have to say, oh, exactly, oh, Mao is useless, this was useless. That's the, the politics of, of being able to, to you know, go on this thing. Um, Shankar's question. I, I think Shankar, you, I, I, would, I would agree with you. I think I've, um, the kind of stabilizers I'm talking about are, are, are potential, they're structural, they're longer term, they're also contingent on certain sort of things, ground rules being followed, and a certain rational behavior patterns between what I call people who have the same stakes, the, between the stakeholders. Uh, so maybe it's a wish list in terms of how stabilizers would, under conditions under which stabilizers would work. You're absolutely right, um, and this goes back to case, that you have built-in uh, structural irrationality in a capitalist system. Uh, you have a different kind of irrationality in a system which is authoritarian. If somebody makes a bad rule, applies to everybody. But here, individual, individuals are all being rational, but collectively you're going in a different direction. And you also then, you have the power along with it to uh, make things much worse by manipulating institutions and rules of the game which allow predatory behavior. And I think that's what actually got us in, in crisis after crisis. And if you look at it now, all the conditions which apply to the pre-crisis stage of 2007 are back in, back in place now, on, on a larger scale, because you know, the financial overloads are even higher. So this is the kind of fear which was there about, you know, are these uh, reserves uh, enough and that kind of thing. Yes, I think so. My answer to you, I think you are right in saying that, am I being optimistic? I think the, uh, the possibility of something being triggered off by either silly statements from silly people uh, or uh, being triggered off by uh, some structural irrationality, you know, something, I think those are real. Those are real. Those are real. And we still don't have any global architect, financial architecture uh, which can control things at all. The IMF is a, is a, is a minuscule minor player. There, there's no, you know, they can impose, they can be a policeman for, for Greece and for third world, you know, other countries. There's no role to have in this. So I, I, I do fear that that is a possibility, which is why we need to have responsible politicians talking to each other. That was the last sentence in my in my, uh, in, 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 my, in my abstract, but it is not a time for pointing fingers and telling, but it's a thing of actually listening and, and so on. But uh, will that happen? My other is for the US, very obviously, uh, we are being run by a doctor, Dr. Dylan New Max, we own my thing. Uh, but you know, but in India, we are doing things which I was, I was also addressing ourselves. I think there's a, there's a break between the rationality. Of the, of, the, of the thinking bureaucracy, the thinking corporate sector, the thinking public intellectuals. There's a break between that rationality, and I think then you get certain forms of hubris coming on top. 
and something which is reasonably unguarded or unthought of uh, in some ways. Uh, so I, I, so that's what I, but you're the master of that, not me. Um, so yes, I, I think that risk and danger is there. I was talking about something more structural and a bit more long-term uh, We have a question here and then a question here. One party comes, one prime minister comes, another one comes, and there have to be essentially changes in all priorities. And therefore, the government gets into a non planned uh, framework. Whereas a country like uh, China uh, and the Chinese characteristics, the government goes on. The Politburo, I suppose, the government, and that goes on and on. And that makes a lot of difference between the growth patterns of China and India. Thank you. Uh, next round. We finish these. Thanks, uh, Shwini. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture. Sana Paul. Uh, I thought I'd ask you, you know, with such huge uh, reserves, you haven't discussed much about their debt, which is also very high, as well as the BRI, the project, which is likely to run into heavy debts too. So, what will be the Total situation in future, according to your projections. And the second thing is that, which is also I thought you could mention, is about opening their own markets because they've got such huge reserves. But there is a lot of feeling that they do not open their markets properly through serious means. Thanks. Thank what is my my understanding of the BRI? Um, you know, it's, it's, all these are very big words, and they are large, massive, complex, multi-country, multi-tier, multi-you know, um, year things. So, uh, simple reduction has to be some sort of adjustment. We have some kind of a call. At this point. So, I, the answer is very based on that type of thing. I, my own sense is that there is one strand which is all the time, which is partly true. That it was. Um, um, addressing also problems internally of excess capacity in various kinds of industries that they had in China. So they you know, have good capital goods, it's more infrastructure, there is that type of thing for sure. But that's a short term need, but the need was quite considerable, so it can carry on for a bit, that's fun. The other is that, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you go in for this belt and road and you can actually, uh, if you can control uh, the, the scale of, of your investments, uh, you can also then use it as a counter cyclical um, a variable in your macroeconomic policy. Yeah, because there, there's nothing you know, obliging you to necessarily go in a certain way at a certain point in time. You can sort of, uh, you can balance it. If, if you have other sorts of uh, needs in this regard, you could. That's one. But I think that the third side, there is of course another side which is uh, strategic and, um, and, um, and political. There's, there's no doubt about it. But I think the strategic and political is also linked to the economic. Uh, the thing which I find so striking is that the BRI, to my mind, is also a reflection. Would China go? I would raise, let me phrase the question from my side if I were to ask you. Would China go in for a BRI of this kind if it was not committing itself to an export debt strategy for the next 20 years, 15 years? 
this is this is my worry. You see, they are they are effectively committed themselves because this is they are going along those lines of, of exports and, so, and they are going to the places where they're going to get. So there, there's a model there that we are going to carry on on this on this uh, on, the, on this strategy. Now this is an open zone because if you have like already there are signs of, of, of wage costs rising and uh, some things becoming uncompetitive. If you go along on this strategy for another 10-15 years, you would have to so dramatically change your production structures, your the, the composition of your exports, enter new sort of zones and new markets. Um, and you find yourself competing with India in, in third world countries, because we can actually do the next round of manufacturers and others as well. There, I think there's a, there's a chance element in it, but I think they are going down this strategy. Otherwise, to my mind, it does make sense to have strategic issues and other matter, but right? you know, on this scale. Um, do they lump? Um, is there a risk involved in this, the RI with all that? I think the risk, yes, there is. You invest something, um, do you get the returns back directly? No, you get the returns back through the government. You're given a loan, you're a money lender. It's in your interest to make sure that your the person taking the loan is productive, has a job, can actually repay your loan, or has the asset that you can go and capture. You see, you, you must remember the German case of Germans going off and actually taking ports and airports as collateral and, uh, from, from Greece, which I found one of the more disgraceful uh, acts of, of, of economic uh, diplomacy in recent times. You capture your STR and really will take this whole period of time. Thank you very much. It belongs to us now. Something along those lines. But you can't do that. You can't do that. So the result would be that you would have made the investment and you don't get the money back. So on the one side, one says that one is passing on the risk to a, for return to, to the third world country, to the third country. Uh, but that risk is only passed on if they're going to pay it back to you. Uh, so you must then be interested in, con 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 in creating the conditions where the thing can come back. Because you can't just you know, squeeze it out from them. And this is getting you into a very open zone. So I think evaluating it as a complex infrastructure project in terms of a longer term thing, they want access to EU markets. Yeah, going across in one way or the other, uh, going across into Latin America, they want to ensure that their trade routes are not uh, cannot be interfered with, which is one of the reasons they are doing this. They are along the uh, along the belt which is uh, going across. Uh, they are also laying fiber optic cables. Yeah, because they want to be free from the U.S. kind of a thing, things of this type. So, so there are returns which you can't convert into economic returns, but it is a very large scale project. And there is no further insurer behind you. You are the ultimate uh, principle. And I think this, to my mind, is a is, is a risk factor. China, do they have to go at a breakneck speed all along it? So I said, not necessarily. They can slow it down and go faster. But there's a lot of capital invested, and you cannot lose it as dead weight. So, but this time it's sort of working. Things are happening. Huh? So this, uh, even the train journey is actually the things are moving. So. Uh, it is in their interest that the world economy, the European economy, does well, uh, and so on. So, this is what I meant by the kind of stabilizing. If you if you get into a place where for the next ten years it's going to be bad, it is going to affect you in a very bad way, and I think that's what the other side is playing on. So, when you have two in a evenly matched um, strengths, then who will bring first? Who, you know, two belligerents can go on and cause a lot of damage to each other, but they recognize that they can keep causing damage to each other. They could also avoid and not cause the damage. But then Mr. Trump has taken himself into a position where he suffered himself. So that, that's what you said, you know, it's the politician and the populism separate the people from it, indeed. Uh, uh, now, you said democracy, uh, short term. I, well, you know, you have democracy in so many other places. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. In, in Italy, you had, um, I think, 20 odd governments uh, since the, the war, maybe even 30 governments since the war. Huh? 50 by 1980. So you see, nobody noticed. Uh, you could forgive school children to enter the wrong, the paper is printed uh, in the general knowledge paper who is your prime minister of your country, and by the time it comes out, there is somebody else. The answer has been given, and you all get zero. Uh, so I think that under the level of this leadership, political leadership, 
there is also a, a bureaucracy. Um, our esteemed colleague here has already raised some questions about the, about the proficiency of that, uh, that level. But I think civil service and bureaucracy uh, provide the continuity in these systems. How well they do it is another matter. And I think our problem is tradition. Whether you're a bureaucrat, whether you're a politician, whether you're a local contractor, the idea is not productivity from a productive process of investment, but each into the capital, capture, predate. That's that's where the problem comes. And that's why also things take so long. And you know the bad example when the government changes and the world is one question. Now one last bit on BRI. Um so the thing on BRI was that uh, the debt. Yeah, well, they, they have done these loans, and so they're on the books. Uh, the debt has gone the other way. Um, I I think the, it's the same. The answer is, in a way, my, my previous answer, it's a problem if you don't expect repayments. You see, that's, that's where the problem is. And I think... Yes, so now... The Chinese would say they'd be laughing to each other and say, Charlie would be, do it again, you know, somewhere else. You know, there is a kind of a question about what is it they are interested in. And um, so if you can effectively buy something, uh, it's a down price, and you do this and you get the person in there. So it, it's a game of money lending. Money lending is one side of it, political control is another, uh, and you have the resource. Uh, which is not being, I mean, whether it's being used well or not at this time is another issue. But there are ports on the other side of uh, Latin America, there are ports on the middle. It's, it's, the, it's the early stage, if you go back into history, it's the embryonic stage of a imperial global ambition, uh, where you can put your flags on a world map at various points, uh, and you want to protect your roots and everything else. And that's what's bugging the rest of the world. So time is passing and tea is waiting, so last few questions to Lady here and first person. So Lady first, please. Uh, actually, we already mentioned my question was related to you know the bad debts, how to recover. So like they've done in Sri Lanka, they've taken over the port, 99 degrees. So anyway, well, you. Uh, so I'll ask another question, which is the water wall. You know? So. Can you reflect on that in relation to India? Last question. The only Indian who attended the inaugural conference of the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative in Beijing, was Sudhinder Kulkarni. He was a journalist from Bombay. India boycotted the conference. Sunindar Kulkarni, on return to India, wrote a fine article in NDTV.com uh, in which he said the speech made by Xi Jinping, inaugural conference, inaugural speech made by him, was one of the most brilliant speeches he had ever heard. And he said that no Indian had ever delivered a speech of that kind, quality and vision and perspective. Which uh, did, did you see the NDTV? Uh, uh, yeah, I could see. So, I believe Pakistan attended the conference and took advantage of Chinese investment in Pakistan. Whereas India has made a huge opportunity, according to Sudhinder Kulkarni. Do you think it was uh, such a colossal mistake on the part of India? I, I would suggest that you whisper this question to the gentleman sitting to your right. Uh, uh, and he might, he might whisper something back. Uh, my, I think your, your, India, this is where hubris comes in, to some extent. You know, um, in 97, when I, uh, one of the trips very early on, you went and met um, Teng Xiaoping, to our, to our interview, five of us, all over the place. And that's what I heard for the first time, the color of the cat. And we all like to quote this, saying, look, you know, China color the cat. So why don't we apply it when we actually think of infrastructure projects from China? 
does it bother you that the capital is coming from China or coming from somewhere else? Uh, if you can make a project which is, say, a road from here to there and make sure that you actually, there is nothing strategic or something about it, if your most concerns are taken care of, why should you worry about it? Treat it like any other commercial, that's a catch. Why do you worry about the color of the catch? So I think that we, uh, what, from what I've seen from a distance, I think many of you are, you know the details from the inside, and I don't in that way. But my own sense is that India is, uh, it's an ongoing opportunity. So let's say we, we should use it. That's one of the points I was making at, at the end, which is that we are sort of in a slipstream. Um, and in that follower status, at this stage, I think there are many opportunities, given, especially given the trade war. Trade war is opening it, even without the trade war, opportunities will open up because they're structural in nature. Uh, and we have that same sort of hand me down effects. But uh, with the trade war, many other opportunities are also opening up. Uh, don't overstate them, but there are many opportunities. And I think, uh, so it's an ongoing thing for, for BRI as well. But uh, it was one of the ambassadors, who was it? Um, uh, Kishan uh, Rana. Am I right? Uh, Krishnana, and he, he was pointing out that in order to make uh, best use of Chabahar, they need to actually have access to uh, for, for Afghanistan and Pakistan they have to, to be able to access, use the port in a full way. So, so I think there, there are many reasons as to why there should be a cooperative approach, but if it involves a third party like Pakistan, I think the uncertainty is multiplied enormously. Because there's a new uh, kind of a stake uh, which is brought in, a new joker card. Because uh, I think a stable, relaxed arrangement between India and China would take the wind out of the sails of some of the key stakeholders in Pakistan. Uh, this is my, my feeling. They, uh, they live on, 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 a, on a stress factor which is has been sustained. And so they, there is that, and uh, China is. So I, 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 I fear that the policies are such. That it may be difficult, but in the meantime, yes, to participate in, uh, uh, you can pick and choose to some extent. Now, there's a lot of investment coming in from China at this point in time. I think, if anything, instead of worrying about BRI investments, I think people should be worried more about what's coming in into the digital economy, what's coming into uh, into your media. Uh, if you take the back, the the, the BAT three uh, ones, there and, and you know your payment uh, platforms. Uh, with all the all the data, where is it stored? It's stored in China. It's not stored in the, somewhere in the desert in uh, Arizona or whatever. So you're looking at uh, here already. That's way advanced, way advanced. <laughs> so I, I think there's a to some to, there's a disconnect in our in our, in our thinking somewhere, and I think it may be because we have come to some bottom line things in relation to China and you want something something there. So that's my response. Uh, uh, water wars. Uh, I, you, I take this as a compliment <laughs> that you think I can give you an answer to almost anything that you, you ask. Um, I, I have a, a young colleague and I have an older colleague who are both specialists in water wars, Central Asia, China, and this, that. And of course, I think you're thinking about us on the, on the south side. I, um, I, I'm speechless. <laughs> Uh, I would like to say things which, and they are, they are obvious. Things are some of the things are obvious, but the, the capacity to do damage to your neighbors, um, this is a is very tempting. Um, and I think corporate solutions on on the, these are not public goods. These are technology. They're not public goods, but uh, these are strategic goods, and uh, and I think the longer term thing has to has to prevail, but these are very complex. I think there's, at this stage, I would say that it's a world which belongs, I think diplomacy is, is at a premium. It's like in the 19th century, early 20th century, you know, the great game, you know, is, is open. And um, so the, the number of parameters which are loose and open, and big parameters in economics and in politics, is enormous. The number, you know, it takes, Turkey, Russia, this, that, the other, and it, how is all, how, how is the game laid out? It's not just a simple win-win or lose win So I think there is a, a, a solution hopefully can be found, but I hold myself hold uh, my breath. But I'm not given to holding my breath, as you can see, so. Uh, was there any last? Uh, Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.
much indeed. Tea awaits us outside.